excited about having our joint worship service today with Cornerstone Church. Many of you guys know uh, this is Ben Ellis, and Ben is the pastor at Cornerstone. And so before we got into the, uh, get into the message today, I want to uh, just give a little bit of an introduction uh, and uh, let Ben share with you guys a little bit about what's going on at their church. Um, but uh, me and Ben are actually going to co-preach this message today. Uh, and I've never done this before. Have you ever done this, Ben? Never. So this is our first time, uh, and we promise there's only like 65 slides in the computer back there. Uh, so we'll be out by a cool 12, you know, 50 or so. Uh, just joking with you guys. But uh, let, me, uh, let me first, I want to pray for Ben and for their church, and then uh, I'm going to ask Ben a couple questions, then we'll jump into the message. Sound good? Father, we thank you so much uh, for Ben, uh, for Charlotte, for uh, the entire Cornerstone uh, Church, Father. We pray uh, that you continue to guide their steps, uh, give them discernment as they uh, seek to share the gospel and make disciples and minister right here uh, where you have planned them, Father. I'm, I'm so thankful for Ben's friendship. I thank uh, you, Father, for uh, just the opportunity that we get to walk uh, with each other through ministry. God, I pray that you would uh, renew him and refresh his, his heart and his mind. God, I pray that you would uh, protect his family. God, I pray that as they, uh, as they uh, learn together and as they struggle uh, with ministry and, and growing pains and all the things that come uh, with leading a church, Father, I pray that you would uh, just give them everything that they need. Father, I pray that you would uh, allow his church to just lift him up and pray for him. Father, I pray that our church would pray uh, for their entire church, God, that we would uh, be an encouragement, we would be uh, accountability, we would be uh, a support uh, for what they're doing. And so, God, uh, we're so thankful uh, to have this service today, God, and we pray uh, that you are glorified through our partnership and through our commitment to seeing disciples and the gospel shared right here in Pasadena, Deer Park, and LaPorte. We love you. We thank you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. All right, so one of the things that I wanted uh, you guys to do uh, when Ben uh, approached me about this, uh, I don't know, six weeks or so ago, um, we, uh, I, I kind of had an idea that I wanted you guys to kind of know, because I have been talking with Ben on a regular basis, so I know the things that are going on at their church and some of the victories that they've had, but some of you guys may not know about some of those things. And so first I wanted to uh, give Ben the opportunity to just kind of give our church an update uh, a year, a little year and a half or so uh, since we commissioned you guys. Uh, so fill us in on what God's been doing at Cornerstone. So God has, uh, he's shown up, he's continued to show up big. Every time there's been a need, we've uh, had provision from him. But some of the greatest things that God's done for us is uh, in that time frame, we've baptized 15 new believers, so we can celebrate that together, right? So God is absolutely moving in our midst. Uh, we are reaching uh, the unchurched, we are reaching the lost, and so uh, I want to tell you guys thank you, right, because you guys voted to commission us as a church. It wasn't just Jason's doing, it was just the church body as a whole. And so I want you guys to, to celebrate that with us. Uh, we've also partnered with a missionary in Nepal. Um, so we are gearing up right now for a, a trip in March. We're headed to Nepal. Uh, we're going to send three of our uh, church members out to Nepal. And they're going to go to the far west side of Nepal to share the gospel. And this is hard for us to imagine, uh, but they're going to go a five days hike out of civilization into the mountains and share the gospel uh, with people who have literally never heard the name Jesus, right? So that's a pretty big deal. Um, so they're, they're, uh, we're all in prayer for that. We're raising funds for that. Um, and now we've started a discipleship process to get them ready to share the gospel uh, overseas. In that, we've been supporting this missionary. His name's Jared. And so I want to share just a little bit about what's going on with Jared with you guys. Um, He's planted probably close to 800 churches as you look at the network as it grows. Um, just a few years back, if you were to ask uh, what the 
uh, Christian population in Nepal was, you would have heard it was 0%. Uh, today, you would hear it somewhere upwards of 6%. So the church is, is growing in Nepal. We're going to get to be a part of that. Uh, but just last week, I shared with uh, Cornerstone, one of Jared's missionaries uh, was arrested. They found out that he was a preacher. It's illegal to share the gospel. They arrested him. They were uh, demanding large sums of money. I did get an update from Jared this week. Uh, he's this uh, disciple of his name is Santa, and he is no longer in jail. He has been released, and so Jared's stateside right now, but he's looking forward to getting us some more information, so we can celebrate that as well. <clears throat> All that being said, we did go public August 12th. Uh, since that time, our church attendance has uh, increased probably 40 to 50 percent. We're running close to 100 people now, um, and so we continue to reach our community with the gospel, and uh, part of that goes into loving one another, and that's what we're going to talk about today. I'm excited. Uh, just to share in that with Jason and, and you guys. So take some notes. Yeah. Hey, one last thing. How can our church continue to pray for you guys? Is, is there some specific things? Obviously, we'll pray for Nepal, uh, but what are some ways that we can pray for you ongoing? Yeah, so I think um, right now our greatest need is time, right? Uh, there's only 24 hours in a day. Uh, being a bivocational pastor is tough. Uh, I'll just be transparent with you guys. It's very tough. Uh, between Exxon and the church, we're looking at 100 hours a week. That's not counting family, plus the volunteer fire department, the chaplain, uh, and seminary. So uh, just pray for rest um, and time management and continue to pray that disciples are raised up so they can start carrying some of this burden, right? We're told to to carry one another's burdens in the scriptures. And so that would be the greatest prayer need that I think that I have right now. All right, we can do that, right, church? All right, well, if you have your Bibles, uh, why don't you guys go ahead and turn to John 13. And uh, so this is in the midst of our series, and uh, we've been covering the last two weeks on One Small Step, and, and really it's this, uh, this push and this motivation that we're trying to give you guys to be uh, a church in the congregation that is, um, you know, taking initiative and, and taking that step. That's what our whole ser- uh, message was about last series, and then we start off this, this week, just I mean, this series kind of pushing you guys, and then last week you saw... Uh, four or five wonderful opportunities uh, outside of our church, plus a few that were inside of our church, and where we said, hey guys, uh, these are mission opportunities. These are play, uh, people that we have partnered with that we want to encourage you guys to find out more information about the bridge and wheelhouse and sign up to go to iHeart Marshall, as you heard in the announcement video, and uh, uh, our, our uh, Alaska mission trip. Justin and Aaron uh, and Jimmy just got back, and they have, uh, I'm sure, lots of information they can share with you about the things that they saw being on the front lines. And so we really, uh, hopefully, given you guys lots of opportunities to say, man, I can make a difference. And then today, you guys are already seeing a, a small step in faith that we took like I said, a, a year and a half, two years ago, as, as we met Ben and as we began to pray about what God is doing in their church, uh, we have already seen some, some good fruit from the things that they're doing, uh, and we can, uh, we can push you and, and ask you to continue to pray for these things, to pray for time and refreshment for Ben, to pray for uh, continuing of making disciples. And so today, we're going to continue with that. Uh, and we're going to look at um, what controls us, but more, more than that uh, is what controls us. Uh, is it leading us to things that are being beneficial to the gospel, or is it just creating more hurdles? And so in John 13, uh, we see this, this really important passage of Scripture where Jesus uh, is engaging with his disciples, uh, and he, he shares some really, really telling things as he prepares to go to heaven. And I think it gives us a perfect blueprint of how we can look at our lives and say this is something that's working or this is something that's not working. So join me in John 13. We're going to start in verse 33, and we're going to go through 38. It says, My children, I will be with you only a little longer. You will look for me, and just as I told the Jews, so I tell you now where I'm going, you cannot come. A new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples. I'm going to read that again. You guys say it with me. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. That's, that's important. Circle that, underline it, uh, highlight it, whatever you got to do. And Simon Peter asked, Lord, where are you going? And Jesus replied, where I'm going, you cannot follow now, but you will follow later. Peter asked, Lord, why can't I follow you now? I will lay down my life for you. And then Jesus' famous words back to Peter Jesus answered, will you really lay down your life for me? Very truly, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Now remember this, and in in the context of this, Jesus has just finished washing his disciples' feet, right? He's just done one of the things, one of the the clearest pictures outside of the actual crucifixion of someone serving and loving and sacrificing for somebody else. Jesus paints this beautiful picture right before the cross 
of what he was willing to do for the people that he loved. And then he goes into the thing saying, look, I'm going to heaven. I'm, I'm trying to prepare you guys. I'm trying to, to give you guys the right tools that you need to do what I'm going to call you to do. So Jesus, is, as, he, as he has been doing most of his three years of ministry, he is preparing the disciples. He's teaching the disciples. He's trying to give them as much uh, insight into what God is calling them to do as he can. And he goes into this back and forth with Peter, right? And then it ends, and you're like, man, that's kind of a harsh way to end, right? Jesus loved Peter. In fact, he would later say, remember we talked about this, that Jesus would say, man, upon this rock I will be my church. He was talking to Peter. And we know after the context that he wasn't talking specifically about Peter, but that Jesus is the rock by which the, the church is built. But Jesus here has this interaction with them, but it doesn't end there. If you jump into John 14, 1 through 4, Jesus continues in his dialogue. Listen to what he says. He says, do not let your hearts be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me, and my Father's house has many rooms. If that were not so what I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come back and take you to be with me, that you also may be where I am. And you know the way to the place where I'm going. So Jesus doesn't leave us with, hey, Peter, you're going to fall short. You're going to disown me. You're going to mess up. You're going to be disqualified. No, Jesus says, hey, you're going to mess up. And he goes on to say, but listen, I'm going to a place to prepare for you. I'm going to secure this place for you. And then uh, just a few verses later, Jesus kind of gives them a reiteration of what he said in John 13 at the end, where it says this. Jesus is changing the whole fight here. He says, very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. And they will do even greater things than these because I am going to the Father. So again, Jesus reiterates, look, if you believe in me, you're going to do these things, but I'm going away. But he says, and I will do whatever you ask in my Father's name, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son, and you may ask for anything in my name, and I will do it. If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. So Jesus here tells them, listen, I'm going to heaven. I'm going to be with the Father. But in my place, God is going to send the Holy Spirit that's going to guide you, that's going to direct you, that's going to help you in this pursuit to love one another, to continue to do the things that I have done, to, uh, to make disciples and to share the gospel and to do all of these things. And in fact, Michael Todd, he's a pastor up in Oklahoma. He has a brilliant analogy that goes perfectly with this passage of Scripture. And what he does, he, he talks about, how many of you guys owned an Atari? Any of you? A few of you? Richard said that there was a game system before the Atari. Did anybody know what that was? He told me I forgot. Anybody? A what? All right, that thing. All right, so, uh, so and he, t- he talks about how, man, whether it was an Atari, and then you have these game systems right now today, you know, uh, Xbox One X, and you have the PlayStation 4, and you have these virtual reality uh, games and things like that, and it's crazy how different the graphics are and the things that you can do with these games, whereas when I first started playing games, you know, like, you're playing, like, the little game where, like, the little ball's bouncing around, and you just have to move the stick, right? Uh, and now, like, you can do all kinds of stuff. You're in, like, these 3D worlds, and you're going around, and you have Fortnite and all this stuff. How many of you teenagers play Fortnite? Y'all are lying. They're lying. <laughs> all of them play. How many of you adults play Fortnite? Any adults that play Fortnite? There we go. We got one. All right, so uh, it's crazy, but what he was saying is, uh, Michael Todd says the, the, the crazy thing about that is whether or not you were playing Atari or you were playing the brand-new 3D virtual reality game, every game has a controller that is controlling the things that you do. And he, he goes on to tell his congregation, he goes, man, I wish that somebody would have told me as a brand new believer that I would have to fight every single day for what controls me. And I think all of us can re- relate with that, that all of us have something that is controlling us. And it doesn't matter how much we have upgraded, right? This isn't just uh, for those brand new Christians uh, that, man, the graphics hasn't been upgraded. Life is still, they're struggling through life. Or you have it all figured out. You have the nice house. You're married. You have kids. You've done it all. You're still, every single person is controlled by something. And he says, man, you guys have got to choose every day whether or not you're going to let sin and the flesh control you or you're going to let the spirit control you. That's a choice that you have to make. And he goes on in, in this analogy, and he, he, he kind of uses the, the boxing thing. He goes, ding, 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 in this corner, undefeated for the last month, sin. You have given into it every single day for the last month. He is reigning victorious. 
You don't have to raise your hand, but I imagine that there are people in here today that feel that way. Man, for this last month, I have let sin and my flesh and just things control me. Greed, envy, lust, whatever it is. Those things have just had a stranglehold of my life, and I've given in every day. And those things have directed my steps. And he goes on to say, and in this corner, the spirit of the living God, more powerful than any force, able to overcome any obstacle. And yet for a month, we haven't even looked his way. He said, it's the fight of your life. And that reminds me perfectly of what Jesus is trying to get these disciples to understand. As he's serving them, as he's sacrificing, as he is washing the feet of somebody that would turn him into the cross. Jesus understood. And I have to got, I've got to get these guys to understand, to choose to pursue me and to let the Spirit direct them. Because this is a fight that's going to go on every day. And in fact, in Galatians 5.17, I have this question. How do I know if I'm being controlled by the spirit of the sin? Jason, how do I know that? You say, man, maybe you've been the one that's been that month. Jason, that's looked like my month. So how do I know? How do I know if I'm letting the spirit control me or I'm letting the flesh control me? Galatians 5.13-17 gives us a, a perfect picture of this. As Paul uh, kind of uh, lays out this, this struggle, listen to what it says. It says, you, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in what? In love. For the entire law is fulfilled in keeping this one command, love your neighbor as yourself. If you bite and devour each other, watch out or you will be destroyed by each other. So I say, walk by the Spirit. And you will not gratify the desires of the flesh, for the flesh desires what is contrary to the spirit, and the spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict, or they are fighting with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. So there's this battle going on between the sinful flesh and the spirit who wants to lead us to righteousness. How do I know? If you're taking notes, we're going to give you five things this morning, five markers that can help you see, am I being led by the Spirit or am I being led by the flesh? Because catch this, Jesus told Peter, listen, apart from me, apart from letting my Spirit guide you, apart from you pursuing the things that I've called you to, you will fail even with good intentions if you let sin control you. How many of you guys have ever played video games with somebody and their excuse is always, well, you gave me the broken controller, right? Iris, Iris has been there. But you know what? Iris is shady. She will break the controller and give you the wrong one. I know it. I just feel it. Iris, you got to watch her. Um, but man, that's how Richard is, right? He's always like, oh, you gave me the wrong controller. The A button sticking or something like that. No, you just picked the wrong controller, bro. I'm sorry. You know that that one is the beat up one. You shouldn't have picked it, right? We have to be specific and we have to be intentional in pursuing righteousness. Jesus said that to Peter. Said Peter said, look, Lord, I will lay down my life for you. And Jesus says, no, you won't. Even in good intentions, if you're not letting the Spirit guide you, you're going to fall short. So apart from God directing us, apart from Him, we will fail even with good intentions. So if you're taking notes, the first thing that you need to understand is love is our marker. How do we know if we're being led by the, by the flesh or by the Spirit? Love is our marker. The mark of a disciple, just like Jesus said already, is love, that we love one another. He then went on to say that the greatest command is to love God and love your neighbor as yourself. Paul reiterated that when he said the, the law is fulfilled in loving one another. That the Spirit will help us to walk humbly in love. So that's the first thing that we have to understand as, as a people, is that if we want to take this one small step, if we want to get out and, and, and volunteer at the bridge or the wheelhouse or any of this number of opportunities that we're pushing and urging you guys to do, we have to be people and believers who are marked by love. Far too often, we're marked by judgments or being hypocritical or being skeptical or being exclusive. We have to be people 
that are marked by love. Romans 12, 9 through 13. It says, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good, be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need and practice hospitality. Like I said last week, let's be a church that when when the community looks and says, man, we are better because Memorial Baptist Church exists in our community. Man, they love this community so well. They meet the needs. They're telling people about Jesus. In Ephesians 5, 1 and 2, it goes on to say, Follow God's example, therefore, as dearly loved children, and walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us as a flagrant offering and sacrifice to God. Our actions, listen to me, church. You can write this down. Our actions, my actions and your actions, will clearly tell whether or not we are being led by the flesh or we're being led by the Spirit. Scripture says that if we walk humbly in love, that we will sacrifice for one another, that we will have a zeal in the helping of our brothers and our sisters. And that's exactly what today is all about. It's exactly why we're partnering with Cornerstone. Because we want to say, man, look, we believe in what you guys are doing. We want to pray and encourage the things that you guys are doing. We want to lift you up as you seek uh, to overcome the hurdles and the things that Satan wants to put in the way of the gospel being spread right here. So again, understand that your actions will tell you first and foremost whether or not you're being led by the flesh or by the spirit because the mark of a disciple is love. Sorry, I'm not all fancy like Jason. i got to have a stand. <laughs> but if you're taking notes, that brings us to our second point, which is this. is uh, Love is sharing the gospel. So if you want to write that down, love is sharing the gospel. And as I say that, I, I want to look at this from two different angles this morning real quick. Uh, as we think about the phrase, love is sharing the gospel, I want us to look at it first from this aspect. That in loving one another, we are evangelizing a lost world because loving one another puts Christ on display for a watching world. So in loving one another, we are putting Christ on display for a watching world. You can write that down too. If we go back to the beginning of the church, back in Acts chapter 2, we see that love is really what drove people to be a part of the church. Ultimately, it was Christ's love for the people in his public display of affection on the cross. But after his ascension, seeing that love manifested in the church itself, in the people, right? So uh, Christ puts his love on display, and then he ascends to heaven, but people are still driven to the church by love. And so when they look at, when, when you go into Acts chapter 2, we'll go ahead and jump there now. Acts chapter 2, 45 through 47, here's what we read. It says, we get a glimpse of what this would have looked like. They were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. And so ultimately, what we see is Christ's love publicly displayed on the cross. But after his ascension, we see that love manifested by the people of the church, the church body, in generosity and sincerity and honesty and unity. And so we read that in Acts chapter 2, and if you were to go on in your studies of Acts and you get to chapter 5, you'll read how people just wanted to uh, put the sick in the shadows of Peter, put their people in the, in the shadows of what was going on uh, with that first century church and, so, and what it stood for. They wanted to see what that was like. They wanted to be a part of it. They desired to be a part of it because the church was actually different than the world that was around it. They weren't only different in word, but they were also different in deed and how they loved and how they behaved and their acts of generosity. And God moved in and through that, and you read that as you study through Acts chapter 5. In fact, he moved so mightily, again, that people wanted it so bad they would carry people on cots to put them in shadows. And as I say that, I just wonder today, church, what is it about Cornerstone or what is it about Memorial that makes us different than the world around us? What is it that makes us different 
than the world around us like we read about of this first church. And clearly I'm not talking about a fancy building, the best programs. I'm certainly not talking about the best speaker uh, because I am not that guy. I'm talking about you guys as the people. What makes you different, church? And I want to challenge you guys with two questions. What is it that makes you different than the world around you? And better yet, are you any different at all? I want to challenge you with that today. I want you to ask yourself that. And I want to submit this to you today as well. If we as a church want to make Jesus known in our community like we are commanded to, then we have to be a church that loves one another like we are commanded to. You should write that down. If, you want to be, if we want to be a church that makes Jesus known like we're commanded to, then we have to love one another like we're commanded to. And so I think if we're intentional about loving one another, then we'll have opportunities to share the gospel. Why? Because people are going to want to know what it is that's different about each of us. What is it that makes us different than the world around us? What makes us tick? And that kind of brings us to the second angle of that whole concept of love is sharing the gospel, and that is this. Uh, not only are we sharing the gospel with the watching world as we love one another, the statement also implies that we, if we are to love one another, then we should share the gospel. And so that's the first point that I want us to kind of write down under this little section here, that we should share the gospel with others because we love Jesus. We should share the gospel with others because we love Jesus. Look, in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, we read this. It says, And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of age. And so we have to acknowledge here that as Jesus gives this command, as his parting desire, his parting command that there with that comes an expectation from the creator of everything that has ever been made everything in existence that we each are responsible for going and sharing the gospel with others think about that the God who breathes the God who speaks and worlds are formed with that kind of authority we are commanded to go and share the gospel that's not an authority that I believe we should take lightly Jason shared just a few minutes ago in John 14 15 uh, when he opened up he, he talked about Jesus and Jesus said, if we love him, we will keep his commands. If you were to read the whole uh, last half of John chapter 14, you would see that Jesus repeats this idea three times. And so, again, that would tell us that it's important for us to go and to share the gospel. It would imply that in our love for Jesus and uh, with that love, there is an expectation that he had that would compel us to act or to behave in a certain manner. If we love Jesus as we say we do, then we will keep his commands one of which is sharing the gospel. So in other words, if we truly love Jesus, then our love for him should drive us to share the gospel with others. And then the second part of that section here is uh, we should share the gospel with others because we love them. We should share the gospel with others because we love them. If we truly believe that we have the key to heaven, why would we withhold that from anyone, right? So if we truly love others, we'll have compassion for them. Each of, in the, each of us in this room today has probably known what it feels like to live without hope. To live, without, uh, uh, to live with a feeling of uh, lostness, to live seeking fulfillment in life from things or people other than Jesus. And my encouragement to you today, uh, church, is to not lose compassion for those who are still living that way. Right? We've been there. Let's not lose compassion for those who are still living that way. Because the truth is that many of us, if we're honest, we've become content with the fact that we know Jesus and other people don't. We've come to accept that we know Jesus and other people don't, and we're content with that. Uh, we rarely take into account that the scriptures tell us of a terrible future for those who would be separated from God through Jesus. Listen to this, 2 Thessalonians 1.9 says, They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. That's powerful. And I think what's sad, church, what burdens me in this uh, fairly, fairly deeply is that I'm afraid that we've become okay with that. I'm afraid we've become okay with that, that we just don't care enough to share the gospel. And I know it's hard to hear, and you might be thinking that that's not you, but let me ask you this question. When is the last time that you cried out to God to ask him to save your family member from that fate, to save your friends from that fate, to save your neighbor from that fate? And when we talk about loving our neighbors, I would, I would question how many of you actually know your neighbor's names? How many of you know your neighbor's names? And so can I encourage you right there? When you leave here today, go learn your neighbor's name. Go le learn your neighbor's name. Make it a point to get to meet with them this week. 
And as you prepare to do that, I want to share an acronym with you guys that will help prepare you as you prepare your hearts to meet them. Write it down. It's bless. We should be able to remember that. We want to go bless our neighbors. Bless. And here's what the acronym stands for. It stands with, uh, the B is begin with prayer. So we want to start in prayer. Begin praying today before you go talk to them about the opportunity that God would provide for you to go and meet them and to lay a foundation so you can present the gospel. And the second thing is this. The L is listen. And don't go just listen so you can tell them the gospel. Go listen. Listen to their hearts. See what it is that drives them. See what it is that pushes them and motivates them. See what it is that causes them to wake up and get out of bed and go to work early in the morning every single day. And the E is eat. Share a meal with them. Invite them over. Have a meal with them. And as you have a meal with them, you'll have an opportunity to listen to them. And as you listen to them, you're going to learn. That's the first test. You're going to learn how to serve them. You're going to see what it is that drives them. You're going to learn what their needs are. You're going to have opportunity to serve your neighbor, to love your neighbor. And then the last S is this, share. As you build that relationship, as you learn what it is that makes them tick and the opportunity presents itself, share the gospel with them. Share Jesus with them. And I want you guys to notice that nowhere in that acronym did I say that you have to become a Bible scholar, right? Just reach out. And love those around you no matter the cost. Following up on that, if we have the first marker being that we're defined by love, that as disciples of people, if if we're being led by the Spirit, that we'll clearly see that in the way that we love, we will also clearly see that in the fact that we will be sharing the gospel. And if we're walking in the Spirit, it is impossible for us to be fully uh, aligned with God's Spirit leading us every day and not and not have this desire to tell people about the hope in Jesus. And the third thing, and this is really important following sharing the gospel, is that we have to be people uh, that reach in and reach out. That love, people marked by love, will reach in and reach out. Meaning this, that as you go and tell people about Jesus, as you share with them the hope and the grace and the freedom that you have, that you have accepted, and you hope that they will too, they will take a look at your life. They will see, is this, person, is this person walking the walk to go along with the talk that they're talking? And, and let me tell you, this is something that I think in the American church, we have done a really, really poor job of, is being people that reach in and reach out. That you see these churches, that man, they are so good about loving each other inside the walls, but they are scared to death to walk outside of those doors. It's like, it's like Ben said, probably some of this maybe come from this, this, uh, this idea that they have to have all the answers and they have to know everything from Genesis to Revelation. They have to be a Bible scholar and they have to be able to uh, be completely uh, competent in everything that might be asked. And so they sit and they say, yeah, not so sure about this. Or you have the churches that are all the way on the other end of the spectrum. And man, they, they want to get out and serve the community. But yet, when they share about Jesus with that community, and that community looks at the church and say, man, they, they, they can't stand each other. They don't love each other. They don't get along. They can't agree on anything. And so people marked by love and people marked by being led by the Spirit, it is clear in the way they act, reach out, meet the needs of people here and there. See, that, that's, that's one of the things that drives me crazy is that we put qualifiers on people. Did you catch that God said that the entire law is fulfilled in loving your neighbor as yourself? In the context of this, there were plenty of people that were not believers. There were plenty of people that did not agree with the same things that some of the followers of Jesus did. And in fact, if you'll remember, there was even quarreling going on amongst those followers of Jesus, trying to figure out, man, where do we we go away from the law? Where do we go away from some of these these old Jewish traditions? How do we we really make sense of what Jesus is calling us to do? How do we we navigate the uh, cleanliness versus unclean? How do we navigate Sabbath versus uh, the needs that are right here in front of us? And Jesus clearly said, the most important thing that you can do is to love people, to tell me, to tell them about me, and to be genuine in meeting the needs around you with people that are like you and people that are not like you. My prayer 
my heart for Cornerstone, my heart for Memorial, is that we would be a church that would begin to break the stereotype that Christians are judgmental and hypocritical, that all we want to do is sit in here with our heads held high and look down on everybody else. Now hear me, that is not in all uh, reference to anything that Cornerstone is doing, and that is not in all reference to anything that Memorial is doing. But let's be a church that will transcend the way that our community views the way that we love both people outside of our walls and the people in here. My prayer is that everybody that walks in these doors, they walk away and say, man, it's a little weird how much they love each other. Like, you know, I got to go back and see if they were just putting on a show or, or something. And I hope that they do the same thing when we're out and we're, we're paying for people's gas or we're serving at the wheelhouse or we're meeting needs wherever, that people say, man, what, what is going on with these people? Because hear me, as we talk about Jesus and as we talk about how mistakes and sin doesn't disqualify us and Jesus pursued us even in the midst of those things, we better be willing to back that up with our own lives. We better be willing to pursue people that have terrible pasts, that have made mistakes. It is hard for us, listen to me, it is hard for us to be in tune with the Spirit and hate someone. You've heard that saying, right, that, you know, I don't have to, I don't have to love you, or I, I love you, but I don't have to like you. Mm. If, you're hate some, if you hate somebody, if you really could care less about somebody, let me tell you, you're not in the Spirit. The Spirit transcends earthly opinions and debates and politics and disagreements. And the opportunity to tell that person about Jesus and to change their life or to help that person be aligned with the Spirit, that transcends any of your personal feelings with that person. And far too often, there is no distinction between believers and non-believers when it comes to that. Let me read you this quote by Jeff Vanderstelt. It says this, Jesus is Lord and we are his servants. A person marked with love serves those around them as though they are serving Jesus. Makes it hard to, to say, man, I, you know, I don't like you, but I still love you. It makes it hard to do that if we view them like Jesus. In doing so, they give a foretaste of what life will be like under the rule and reign of Jesus Christ. Living as servants to the king who serve others as he served presents a tangible witness to Jesus' kingdom and the power of the gospel to change lives. It says, a person marked with love serves in such a way that it demands, demands a gospel explanation, meaning that people will say there is something different about them. Lives that cannot be explained any other way than by the gospel of the kingdom of Jesus. If we want to change the stereotype, if we want to begin that process of, of saying, man, this isn't what church is like for everybody, then we do it by loving people both in this building and outside this building. So if you're following along, that first point was love is our marker. Uh, love is sharing the gospel. Love reaches in. And it reaches out. And we'll go ahead and write this one down. Love is compassion for others. Love is compassion for others. I know you guys have been talking about taking just uh, one small step as maybe you just kind of rethink or reevaluate what it is that drives you or motivates you uh, towards making a difference um, in your life or in other people's lives. And originally I, I had several points that I want to cover. I'll read them to you real quick, but I'm not going to cover them. I'm going to share a story with you. I'm going to try to share a story with you. Um, but... Just, just for reference, in our love for people, we tell Jesus about them, we pray for them, we carry one another's burdens as we listen to their hearts and serve them, and then we go to the nations, we go to the ends of the earth as we hurt for those who are hurting and lost so that we can share the gospel with them. And, and we could break that out, but the more that I really thought about this point, uh, so, something different happened this week. 
Cornerstone already knows I'm a pretty sensitive guy, so y'all just bear with me here. I've told the story probably a hundred times, uh, so get a little better. Uh, but I want to share it with you guys um, because I think that it's a great example of what it looks like to have compassion for one another. So uh, many of you may or may not know, uh, Charlotte and I, we had probably the worst day that we've ever experienced as a couple together this last week. Bear with me, guys. So the day started out like any other day. Uh, I said I'm bivocational. I work at Exxon, so I was on nights. Got up. Kids were excited. Uh, the church was celebrating because we finally got a roll-off dumpster, so the dump truck came and emptied the trash. It didn't have to sit on the floor anymore. It was a good day. I'm telling you, it was a great day, right? So, so they come, and uh, we get ready. Uh, we had some errands to run. Uh, for those of you who, who don't know this, we're, uh, we made a lifestyle transition. We're actually living on the church property now. And uh, we had to get some stuff for, for our new place, for the, for the trailer. And uh, so we went, went to the store. We got that. And on the way back, it was getting kind of late. And uh, I was working nights, like I said. So we said, hey, let's go, grab, let's go grab some lunch. And after lunch, we'll go unload this stuff. It'll be about time for you to go to work, for me to go to work. So I said, okay, um, what do you want to have? And so Charlotte said, man, I think kids eat free at Luby's today. And with four kids, you always want to go to places that give you discounts or free food. So we went to Luby's. Um, and it, it, was a great, it was a great lunch. Um, we, we talked how the kids probably behaved uh, better than they have, all four of them together, for uh, a meal uh, out to eat than they have in a very long time. Um, for those of you who don't know Jackson, he's, he's our little seven-year-old. He's our oldest boy. He's going through a, a growing phase, I guess. Uh, he's putting away food kind of like a garbage disposal, just... Uh, man, he ate his whole plate at Luby's, um, and since he was being good and we were just enjoying the time together, we said, we asked the waitress if she could bring him a, a second serving, so she did. He ate all that, too. Um, it was just a good, good meal, and um, we got ready to go, go uh, check out, right, because we had to pay for this extra food that uh, the Luby server had brought us, and so we get to the front, and Charlotte tells him, hey, we... we we need to pay for this, and the manager, I'm telling you guys, it's a good day. The manager says, you know what, we're just going to comp it. Don't even worry about it, right? So, great day. Free food now. Um, they took the, the trash away. We got free food. Uh, and, <laughs> and Autumn decided that she wanted to get a to-go cup, um, like a drink to-go, right? And so, in, I guess, normal southern gentleman fashion, I grabbed the three boys uh, Jackson and Ezra, and I carried little Levi out. Love you too. So we go out, and we have a minivan. That's right, I'm a dad rocking a minivan. Don't judge me. Um, and so, uh, you know, it has the automatic sliding door. So I pop the kids' doors, I put Levi down, they go around, get in. I get in the driver's seat, get in. And I push the button to close this, you know, from the driver's seat to close the sliding door. Didn't think anything about it. Probably done it a, a hundred times, right? Just moving in the parking lot. We're going to swing around, pick up the ladies, be gentlemen, teach the boys that. Didn't buckle them up. So I put the, the van in gear. And I start going forward. And I saw that sliding door open. And I saw Levi fall out. So I slammed the brakes. Uh, we had barely moved, guys. We'd, we were still in the parking spot, right? Like the van is still physically in this parking spot. And so I, I'm thinking like, oh, that was really bad. He just fell out of the van. I'm going to run around. I'm going to grab him, check him, right? He's probably going to have some scrapes. He's, it's a pretty big door. Um, he's going to be right outside that door. Well, there was an empty parking spot next to ours, and there was a car next to it. And for reasons no other than God, there was a nurse in this car. And he said, uh, back up, back up. Well, in my mind, I'm thinking like, Levi's right outside this door. So there's no way I'm going to back up. I'm going to go scoop him up and get him in the van so we can, you know, check him out. So I go around the van, and Levi is under the rear tire. So he's under the rear tire, and right, sheer panic. So I, I run, and I run back around, and I have to back off my child. I have to back the van off Levi. Uh, so I back it off of him, run back around, scoop him up, 
um, and I'm in my fire department stuff, kind of ironic. Um, scoop him up, and I, I start lifting up his pants leg. So it's on his lower, lower uh, extremities. I lift up his, his right pants leg, and um, here he is. He's not even crying, so I'm thinking, like, man, what, like, what's going on? Nothing. His right leg, not a, not a scratch on it. Um, and so I'm like, okay, wow. Um, and I lift up his left pants leg, and I could tell, like, um, his skin was a little, like, squished looking. I don't know how to describe this, but uh, I could see the tire treads in, in his leg. And so I knew it was bad. Um, about this time, Charlotte comes out. She's not, not doing too well at that point. I just ran over our kid. So she, she comes running out. She's just not doing well at all. The, the, the boys that are in the van are not doing well. Autumn comes out. She's not doing well. Um, and so the scene is not doing well at all, right? So I have, I have Levi. We're, this nurse had got out of his car. He comes over. He starts applying pressure to Levi's leg and uh, to, his, to his upper thigh. But it wasn't really enough uh, because what was just kind of skin with tire marks uh, quickly started turning red as the blood returned to the leg uh, and then blue and then black. And it, it, it was not looking good. Um, and so he tells Charlotte, hey, call 911. So Charlotte's on the phone trying to talk to 911, but it's kind of like Luby's, my kid got ran over. That's really all of it. And, of course, they have a lot of questions they want to ask, right? So long story short, I don't really know how it all played out, but I got Autumn and Jackson uh, out, or I'm sorry, Jackson, and, yeah, J Autumn and Jackson. I put them at the bumper of the van because I didn't want them to see what was going on. And uh, Charlotte got, got to hold Levi. The nurse stayed right there. He was holding pressure on, on Levi's leg. And so I take the phone, and so I'm telling 911. It's a, it's a person that I know, a voice that's very familiar to me. Uh, what's going on? So she says, okay, and, uh, you know, you start hearing sirens pretty quick. And so here they come, they're coming, and um, I remember after I got off the phone, uh, I went back and I, I checked on Levi, and I asked the man, does, does he still have a pulse? Does he still have blood flow to his foot? He said, yes, right? So the nurse says, yes, I'm taking him at his word. That's a good thing uh, that he still has blood flow to his foot. Um, and then I went around to the back of the van. And, and I, I held my composure pretty well during this time. I went to the back of the van uh, to check on. On Jackson and Autumn. And I don't know where this guy came from. I don't know if he came out of Luby's. I don't know if he was pulling into the parking lot. I don't even know why he was there. But we have this nurse who's there by coincidence, applying pressure to the leg. Ambulance is on the way. Go around the back. So there's a guy back there with Autumn and Jackson. And he's on his knees. Takes off his hat. And he's praying with them. They went from sheer terror to praying with this guy. You can see their blood pressure come down. You can see things calm down. Uh, still very emotional. But this guy's praying with them. And he stays there until the ambulance gets there. The ambulance loads up Levi and, and Charla, and, and they leave. And so I have to get the kids and load them back up um, so I can take them to, to Grandma's house so I can get to the hospital. Now, Levi's good. He has some broken bones, but he's, it could have been way worse. But when I, when I think about this story, as I share it with you guys, I think that it's easy for us to look at those two people and say, man, what a great example that those guys were for my kids. That it, the one would come and he would just show compassion. He would put pressure on Levi's leg in that moment, that it would be just a, a calm in the middle of the storm. Uh, or, or the guy that, that was at the back just praying. Again, uh, just another calm in the middle of the storm. But I think if that's where we left it, we'd be missing the bigger point because I think the truth is that more than a great example for my kids, I think it's a great example for everybody that's sitting here listening to the story right now. They're both great examples, both of those guys, because they did exactly what it is that Jesus calls us all to do, and they did it in a way that they were capable of. It was different, but they did it in a way that they were gifted, in a way that they were capable of. 
In our moment of need, they showed up as the hands and the feet of Jesus. One of them was a medical professional who knew exactly how to treat and deal with Levi's physical wounds. And the other one who didn't necessarily have any medical experience knew the one who did. Right? He knew the one who did. But I think what's even more is the fact that that the man that prayed with my kids, I, I don't even know his name, um, the fact that he wasn't a medical professional, it didn't stop him from showing compassion in our crisis. See, instead of focusing on what he couldn't do, he focused on what he could do. Instead of uh, using his lack of medical training as an excuse to ignore the situation, which I think so oftentimes, guys, we use that as an excuse, he redirected his focus from the physical crisis to the spiritual crisis, and he just prayed. He did what he knew how to do. And I share that with you today because I want you guys to see that these are just two ordinary people that took one small step to make a difference. In our moment of darkness, their compassion for us and towards us, it was a beacon of light, a beacon of hope. And as they were the hands and the feet of Jesus to us in that moment, I'll, I'll forever be grateful to them. I might not remember every word that they said last Wednesday. But I'll never forget how they made me feel. And what I would share with you guys today is that is, that is an impact that each of you in this room can have on each other in the world if you will choose to love like Jesus. I mean, think about it. These two guys come in our darkest hour. You think about Jesus. What did he do? He did the same thing for the world. If you were to read the first, chap first several uh, chapters of Romans, you would read as Paul lays out the gospel things like this. In chapter 1, 18 through 20, it says, uh, it tells us that everyone has knowledge of God the Father. You keep reading chapter 1, 21 through 25, all people have rejected God. Chapter 3, 10 through 12, all people are guilty before God. That's a bad God to be guilty before, the God who speaks and things come into existence. And then you read on more in chapter 3, 19 through 20, all people stand condemned for rejecting him. That's some pretty gloomy stuff, kind of like that story that I shared. Like our crisis, that's the crisis of humanity. All of humanity is in crisis. But then, as you continue reading in chapter 3, 21 through 26, we see that Jesus shows up, and we see that he has love, and he has compassion for people. He has a compassion that provides for us in a way that we could never provide for ourselves, a compassion that's rooted in deep, selfless love that would send him to Calvary and have him nailed to a cross to make a full payment and final payment for our sins. And as I think about God, not only sending his son, but the fact that he sacrificed his son for me, it's overwhelming. That thought should overwhelm your emotions, and it compels me to love one another, to love others, to love even the unlovable in a similar manner as Jesus has loved me. Just like those guys were compelled to love us, me and my family, and to act not just through their words, but through their actions on Wednesday, we too are called to love other people in that same manner. And Jesus modeled that for us, and that brings us to our final point. And at this time, I'm going to ask Keith to come up on the praise team to lead us in a time of response, and that is the last point is that love compels us. When we're walking in the Spirit and we're aligned with where God has us, love will absolutely compel you to be the hands and feet of Jesus, to share the gospel, to reach in and reach out, and you will have compassion for all people. And so here's what I want to do as, as we get close, and, and we're going to finish up the series next week, but uh, I want you guys to know that being aligned in the Spirit, and how do I know if the, if the flesh is leading me, the Spirit is leading me? Uh, again, our actions bear out who is the one leading us. And let me tell you that the love of God transcends whatever your story is, whatever your situation is, whatever your circumstance is. And we have got to be people 
of action. Like Ben said, there are so many opportunities at every single minute to major thing that you do in your life. Whether it's as simple as going to eat lunch at Luby's, there's an opportunity. Whether it's as major as knowing that you're going to go and share the gospel with somebody who's terminally ill, there's an opportunity. And the love of God compels you to share his message, to love unconditionally. I'm going to read a couple quotes to you, and then we're going to have a time of response. And I'm going to ask you guys to respond as we sing. Let me read this to you. It says, God's family is also sent like the Son by the Spirit to proclaim the good news of the kingdom, the gospel, and fulfill the commission of Jesus. A church marked by love is more than a Bible study or a small group that cares for other believers. It is made up of spirit-led. This is my prayer over our church. This is my prayer over Cornerstone. This is my prayer over every one of you here. Spirit-led and spirit-filled people who radically reorient their lives together for the mission of making disciples of a particular people and place where there is no gospel gap, no consistent, consistent gospel witness. This means people's schedule, resources, and decisions are now collectively built around reaching people together. Hear me. You may say, well, Jason, you're, you're, you're surely talking about Nepal or Africa. Let me tell you that there are plenty of opportunities right here where there is no gospel present in people's lives. There's pr plenty of opportunity here where there are people that have a distorted view of what church and faith and Christianity look like. And so our call to you in one small step it's to take a look at your life. Are you being led by the Spirit or are you being led by the flesh? And do something about it. Align with what God has for you. Let His Spirit lead you and be a person that is sharing the gospel, that's reaching in and reaching out, that has compassion for other people and is compelled to share, to tell, to do. As Ben said, I'm going to ask Ben to come down here. And as Ben kind of went through... Uh, you know, the beginning of Romans, we see a pretty bleak picture for, for humankind. I mean, there may be some of you in here that have said, you know what, I've always felt like I didn't have worth. I've always felt like my position uh, on earth didn't matter. I've always felt, I mean, I've messed it up and I have, I have I've done a, about as bad and wrong things as you can do. I pray and I hope that you read Romans 3. I pray and hope that you read through that book that, that assures you of the compassion that Jesus has for you in the midst of your brokenness, in the midst of whatever mistakes or failures you think define you. Because Jesus' love transcends that. And me and Ben are going to be right here, and we would love to tell you about the hope of the gospel, the person of Jesus. It's not a magic prayer. It's not a list of things that you can do. Though being aligned with him compels you to act, understand that salvation is not based on whether or not you do enough good things. It's based solely on Jesus' love for you and his, his sacrifice on the cross for your behalf. And what do you have to do? It's not, like I said, it's not a magic prayer. It's put your faith and your trust in him. So here's what we're going to do. Keith and, and the praise team is going to lead us in worship. And, and my prayer for you is that you would respond. Some of you may be to respond in salvation. Some of you may be to respond and say, you know what, I can make a difference. Some of you may say, man, I need, to, I need to spend time right now asking God to move me from being controlled by the flesh to being controlled by the Spirit. And as I do that, I pray with expectation that God is going to do great things. Father, we come to you, Lord, and we thank you Father, for just the opportunity to spend time in your word. Father, to be reminded that you have given us an advocate, a helper in the Holy Spirit. God, to walk us through the times when we will royally mess it up. God, I pray that as we all look at our lives and, and, and try to identify whether or not we're being led by your spirit or not, God, I pray that you would help us see these markers that we, that we find in Scripture. God, that we're known by our love. God, that the gospel 
The key to salvation is so important. Why would we keep it to ourselves? God, that we would be moved outside of these walls. God, that we would have a compassion for all people. That our love for you would compel us to abandon whatever American dream or selfish desire we have and pursue what you have for us. So God, I pray that you move in a mighty way in this moment. We love you. We thank you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Would you stand?